for the study of public choice and private enterprise. And I'm Jeremy Jackson, and I'm the director for the center. We have a mission statement, and this is actually a very abbreviated part of the mission statement, but basically what we try to do is advance knowledge of the sources and causes of human well-being and the distinctive roles of entrepreneurship, free markets, philanthropy, private enterprise, and public policy in achieving it. And this, actually this presentation today, strikes to a lot of these roles that we're trying to play. The talk, of course, today is on the economics of happiness, and we'll also hear a little bit about how entrepreneurship feeds into to happiness as well. Um, I do appreciate any feedback that you can provide for us about um, the program today. So I actually have some people that are going to help me pass out some feedback forms. And we have a lot of events going on with the center throughout the year. On the feedback form, there's a place where you can give us your email address, and we can put you on a, a listserv so that we can tell you about future events. Um, we do have a lot of opportunities that are going to be coming up in the future. So not only do we have events like this, but we also do research as a group. So I, am, as, a, as a researcher, I'm doing research for the group, and I actually have a research assistant that does some work with me. Um, but I also have the ability to support research for faculty and graduate students who are doing work in areas of interest and that are consistent with our mission. So come with me with your ideas, and we have the potential for some funding to get some other projects going. Um, we're also going to be, as, as the future continues to progress, have more events. We're going to have the ability to have some weekend seminars, perhaps not this year, but looking at, to next fall. Um, we're going to have some undergraduate reading groups that we're going to start up. And for being a part of those reading groups, there's also going to be some scholarships available for undergraduate students. So those are some things that we'll keep you informed about if you put your email address on the feedback form that's being passed out currently. Um, we do have some events happening this year. So in addition to this discussion today, um, we have another event on March 9th. So we have Dr. Mitch Mitchell, who's going to be coming and giving a talk on nurse practitioners and the scope of licensing. That event is going to be um, co-sponsored with the School of Nursing. So that's going to be actually on main campus at Sudra Hall on March 9th. And then again in April, we have Virgil Store coming from the Mercatus Center. And he's going to talk about the entrepreneurial response to natural disasters. And that presentation is joint with the Department of Emergency Management at NDSU. Um, with that, you know, in addition to a listserv, there are a number of other ways that you can keep track of what the center is doing and activities. So we do have a center webpage. We also have a Facebook page and Twitter account. So if you want to, you can take out your phones right now and like us on Facebook. We, we, our Facebook page is brand new, so we need people to like us. So please do that. And we'll also be posting the events that we have. We're actually recording this event and we're going to have this posted on YouTube. Um, but with that, I'd like to introduce our speaker for today. Um, so today, we're, we're, I'm very pleased to introduce Dr. Boris Nikolaev. He's a research professor at the Boss Center for Entrepreneurship and Free Enterprise at Baylor University. His current research examines the intricate links between entrepreneurship, economic institutions, and well-being. And specifically, he's interested in the institutions related to the principles of economic freedom, and how these institutions enable people to pursue creative, autonomous, and flourishing life. His research has been published in a variety of interdisciplinary journals, including the European Journal of Political Economy, Economics of Education Review, Empirical Economics, and others. Please join me as we welcome Dr. Nikoyev. This works. How about now? Better? Yeah. Well, thank you, thank you, Jeremy, for the for the nice introduction, and uh, I'm very pleased to be here today. Um, and the weather is so nice, so uh, 
from what I've heard, this has been uh, such a lovely weather for Nordic Openings uh, in the past few days. Um, I'm very excited to be here because there is some, the recent development of the economics of happiness is something very exciting. There are lots of opportunities, especially if you're young and if you're in college and if you're thinking about what you want to do with your life. Um, there are lots of opportunities. When I decided to do this, um, I'm, I'm a recent graduate myself. I, I finished my education, my PhD, about four years ago. Um, happiness was still very marginalized uh, in the field of economics, but today it seems like it's gaining momentum. There is a lot of development. It's, it's a field that's being accepted not just in psychology and sociology, but also in other fields like economics, and I'll talk a little bit more about it. So there are lots of exciting opportunities. Uh, everybody seems to be talking about happiness and being, uh, being interested in happiness these days. I want to start with this graph. This is, uh, this is a graph uh, that was published. This is an article that was published in The Economist a, a few years ago. And the, the article was called The Rich, the Poor, and Bulgaria. One thing that Jeremy didn't mention about me is that I'm, I'm originally from Bulgaria, by the way. Um, so if you look at this, the, so this research was based uh, on the work done by two happiness economists, uh, Betsy Stevenson and Justin Walters at Michigan State University. And what they tried to do is they tried to compile data on happiness across countries, and then they wanted to, to see uh, how happiness correlates with GDP per capita, with income per capita. And what they found out is that the correlation is extremely strong. If you look at this graph, I mean, the richer a country is, so we have GDP on the, on the horizontal axis, and then we have life satisfaction on the, on the vertical axis. So the richer you are, the happier you are. And the correlation is extremely strong. I mean, this is mere correlation, of course, it doesn't imply causation. But what you find out is that the correlation is about 0.85. And for those of you who know statistics, zero is no correlation, the dots are spread all around, and one is perfect correlation. So in cross-sectional studies, to find such a strong correlation is very rare. So it's almost like, so the, point that, the, one point, the first point that I want to make is that when you look at GDP per capita, and you look at life satisfaction, which is one way to measure happiness, you find this very, very strong correlation. It's almost like you're looking at the same thing. But there were exceptions. There were some outliers. If you see this little dot right here, this is actually Bulgaria, my country. And Bulgarians turned out to be dreadfully miserable people. We score at the bottom of international rankings on happiness regularly. And we're this huge outlier because we're not the poorest country in the world, right? There is a strong correlation between income and satisfaction. And Bulgaria is part of the European Union. We certainly have above average income uh, speaking uh, internationally. And yet, we're this really dreadfully miserable people. So the first thing that I want to start is that it's a bit ironic that I'm from Bulgaria, one of the least happy countries in the world, and I'm going to be lecturing you on happiness today. Um, so there is a great deal of interest about happiness, uh, and I think it's also, there, there is a cultural fascination with happiness. And we see this in, in the arts, in music, in fashion. Uh, people are interested in happiness. Um, businesses are interested in happiness. As I've talked about, organizations are interested in happiness. Uh, and also governments are starting to, be, to become interested in happiness as well. How many of you have heard this song with Pharrell Williams, Happy? Raise your hands. Okay. So I think most of, most of us have heard. And I think I was thinking like, what would be a great example of, of, of something cultural? And I couldn't think of a better example than this song, Happy, that came out in 2014. And it became number one in the United States within the first two weeks. And then it was number one in, in Great Britain. And it was number one in actually 29 countries. In the United Kingdom, it was the most downloaded song of all times. In the United States, it was the most sold song uh, for 2014. And if you go on YouTube, it's probably, you'll, you'll find out that it's one of the most watched songs of all time. Uh, Justin Bieber's Baby Baby, of course, is much higher. Uh, so, so I think that this shows that, that people are becoming interested in happiness. And, and it's also something cultural as well. Um, here is a clothing line, by the way. It's actually, the clothing line is called the Happiness Revolution. And I don't know if you can see here what it says, the little font, but it says that this particular clothing line was made to make people happy. Okay, so other clothes that you buy don't make you happy, but this particular clothing line was designed to make people happy. So we see this everywhere. So people care about happiness, and we know this because when we ask people around the world, when we do these surveys, and we ask people 
we ask parents, as a matter of fact, we ask them, what is, it, what is the one thing that you wish for your children? And then we gave them different options. We asked them, do you want your children to have a lot of money? Do you want them to be intelligent? Do you want them to have a successful job or career? Or do you want them to have an overall happy life? I mean, what we find out is remarkable. About 80% of parents say that they want their children to have an overall happy life. And only 5% of parents say that they want their children to be rich. So we value, people value happiness. Uh, there are cross sectional uh, differences. So for example, if parents in India tend to place more value than parents in the United States on successful job or career. But even in India, a majority of parents would say that they would like their children to be to have an overall happy life. If you go on Amazon and if you type the word happiness in the book section, you're going to find 93,000 books that have the word happiness in their title. So there is a lot of Thousands of books have been published on, on the topic of happiness. As a matter of fact, I was teaching a course in the economics of happiness at Emory University a couple of years ago. I did the same exercise, and I found 70,000 books. So in the past two years alone, 20,000 books have been published on the topic of happiness. And one of my students actually calculated that if the average person reads 50 pages per hour, and the average book has about 300 pages, it's going to take about 65 years of your lifetime to be able to read all these books. Thankfully, I've read them all, so I'll, I'll give you a short summary today. Um, Amazon now has a happiness guarantee. I don't know if you've noticed that for some of the products, no, not all of them. And the, the happiness um, industry, the self-help industry is growing, uh, and is growing very, very fast. In the United States, this industry is about $30 million. In the United States also, there are 22,000 self-help coaches. And here is one self-help coach. I mean, you can go watch Tony Robbins. He's very popular. You can go watch him on YouTube. If you wanted to hire him, it would cost you about $1 million. This is how much he charges. If you don't have $1 million to hire him, to be your personal consultant and self-help coach, you can pay $10,000 and go watch him, uh, but only for a weekend, with about 2,000 other people. So you, you don't get to interact much with him. So Jeremy, uh, take notes, not how much I have to pay you next time. Um, this, is, this is Bruno Frey. He's one of the most cited European economists. And he has written a book, and he claims that what we're experiencing right now in, the, in economics is a revolution. So he's written this book, which is called Happiness, a Revolution in Economics. Interesting fact about Bruno Frey, uh, a few years ago, he's a very good scorer, one of the, probably one of the most renowned European scores. He was called self-plagiarizing. I don't know if you've heard about the term self-plagiarizing, but that means when you cite your own work without, when, when you refer to your own work without citing it. So, unfortunately, he lost a bit of his reputation, but don't plagiarize, then that's not good. There is now a dedicated journal to happiness called the Journal of Happiness Studies that Jeremy has actually published papers in. And there is a world database of happiness. One of the founders of the field is Ruud Binghoven. He is from the University of Rotterdam in Netherlands. And he started uh, thinking and collecting studies on happiness back in the 1970s. And he maintains this very large database. Uh, thousands, literally 100,000 studies have been written on happiness, scientific studies. And he keeps track of all these studies and what we can learn about happiness. And you can go on the internet, you can access this database, and you can type whatever you want to research, and then you'll find um, how, what, what kind of findings you see in the literature. Uh, this is Richard Laird. He's a very prominent um, British economist. And he has also written a book which is called Lessons from a New Science, Happiness Lessons from a New Science. And this is a recent book. So, so the topic of happiness is, is becoming much and much prominent. You know, there is a lot of books written on the topic. And uh, there is a lot of articles written on the topic. There is a great deal of interest in, in science uh, on the topic of happiness. But also businesses. I mean, think about it this way. Businesses know that people care about happiness. And what do they try to sell? They try to sell happiness. Of course, we have the happy meal. But as I travel, I try to pay attention to, uh, to different advertisements. Here's the one from yesterday from the airport. This is Dunkin' Donuts. Enjoy hot chocolate of happiness. Um, here is gum, a little piece of happy. Nutella and their campaign spread the happy. Coca-Cola, open happiness. And you see this all the time. 
businesses are selling happiness. Um, if you think about it, um, I was talking to Jeremy earlier, and we talked about entrepreneurship. I'm very interested in entrepreneurship, and a lot of you may be interested in going to business school. Most of the classes that you're going to take in business school have to do with financial accounting, learning how to write a business plan, uh, taking microeconomics, and all these things are very useful. But at its very core, what is entrepreneurship about? In my opinion, entrepreneurship is about something utterly more abstract. It's about happiness. What do businesses try to do? They try to come up with products that either improve our well-being, improve our quality of life, or kind of try to come up with products that alleviate some of our daily frustrations, right? So I think it's very important, and this is something that we don't see a lot in business schools. Business schools don't teach some of the lessons that we've learned from the science of happiness. But businesses understand this. Uh, oh, here is actually, even car manufacturers, manufacturers are now advertising happiness. Uh, happiness requires space, Land Rover. And this is my, my local, local store. I mean, Hydro Flask. Older, longer, happier. So it's supposed to make you happy. Uh, this is Matthew Ricard. He is a self proclaimed uh, Buddhist monk. He is uh, originally a French uh, from Paris. And he decided to, to learn the art of Buddhism. And he is the happiest person on earth, scientifically. So, what we know about happiness, one of the remarkable things about happiness is that about 50% of your happiness is genetic, it's heritable. There is absolutely nothing you can do about it. About 10% of your happiness is, has to do with your social economic background, with your current condition in life, with the institutions around you. Uh, so this would include things like income. And about 40% of your happiness has to do with intentional, what, what psychologists call the intentional activity. It has to do with how you perceive the world. So you hold a lot of power to be able to, 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 to make yourself happy. So he's a Buddhist man, and he... he, he has this practice of does this practice of transcendental meditation, and he can literally make his brain lit up and become on fire and become happy. And you can go and watch him on YouTube where they put him in an MRI scan, and then he starts meditating, and his brain all of a sudden all the regions in the brain that we associate with happiness starts lighting up. So um, the reason why I wanted to mention Matthew Ricard is because a few years ago uh, the World Economic Forum, which is one of the main events in which governments, organizations, businesses um, come together and kind of talk about some of the big issues that our society is facing. Matthew Ricard was present there, and a lot, there was a lot of the sessions would start with transcendental meditation, where he would teach business leaders how to be happy. And so businesses and nations now are becoming more and more interested in this idea of happiness. Of course, it's in our Declaration of Independence, uh, Thomas Jefferson. I mean, uh, if we read it, read it uh, we, we have these rights which are inherent and inalienable, among which are the preservation of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. That doesn't mean that we're entitled to happiness, but it means that we have the freedom to pursue our own happiness the way we, we please, as long as we don't hurt others. So it's in the core of our nation, in the core of our constitution, that you know, our founding fathers recognize that people care about happiness. So nations are, are becoming interested, more and more interested in the topic of happiness. Bhutan, you probably heard about Bhutan, it was one of the first countries in the world when back in the 1970s they decided that instead of using gross domestic product, instead of using material standard of living to measure their happiness, they started measuring what they call gross national happiness. Interesting fact about Bhutan, if you've ever been there, the only grass that grows there is actually marijuana. Okay. So, but the Bhutanese people don't smoke marijuana. They feed it to the pigs. So this is one of the, so this is one of the countries in which pigs are truly happy. Um, back, in the, back in 2008, um, the French president at the time, Sarkozy, recognized that there was a huge discrepancy between, uh, between traditional economic measures of, of, of progress things like GDP, unemployment, um, and, and how people actually reported they were feeding, right? So he created this commission that was led by three Nobel Prize economists, and uh, about 50 people were part of this commission and produced this report, which is one of, the, one of the most comprehensive reports on measuring social progress that we've seen so far. And what the report concluded is that uh, quality of life, 
and social progress have a lot more to do than material standard of living. So uh, there are many other aspects of our lives, and happiness is one of them. It's a critical aspect when it comes to, to our quality of life. So now the Organization of Economic Cooperation and Development produces this index called Your Better Life Index, in which they track in many different countries uh, that are part of the uh, OECD, that track uh, in 12 different categories how life is going for people, and one of these categories is actually happiness. As a matter of fact, they, they have these guidelines that they provide to countries on how countries should measure happiness. It is becoming more and more common that governments now are measuring not just GDP, but they're measuring happiness, they're measuring well-being. So Great Britain, the United States, Japan, France, Chile, Mexico, and many other countries now have what, what we call gross national well-being accounts, where we track not just how, much, how rich people are, but we also track how they feel about their lives whether they feel vital, whether they feel meaning, whether they feel happy, whether they feel satisfied with their lives. So there are lots of opportunities. I mean, 10 years ago, this would have been un unthinkable. But today, it seems like it's moving very, very fast. And, and a lot of people are becoming interested. Whether we should use happiness as a measure of social economic program, it's, it, this is a very important question that we should ask ourselves. But what I'm trying to show here is that there is a great deal of interest. And this is moving very, very quickly. Uh, we have actually a World Happiness Report that has been produced since 2012. If you start looking, there are all kinds of indices that you'll find that, that have happiness as a component to, to well-being. Uh, which, which, which country do you think is the happiest country in 2016? What do you think? Which was the happiest country in the world? Norway. Bulgaria? Norway. Oh. <laughs> You're close, yeah. Uh, and which, which was the least happy country? Sorry? US now. US is actually quite high in the ranking. So here is the, here's the 2016 ranking. Denmark was number one. They score on the, in the international rankings on happiness. They score pretty high. Then you have Switzerland, Iceland, Norway. Generally, these countries, Nordic countries, tend to score very high on, on happiness. And the least happy countries were Afghanistan, Togo, Syria, and Burundi. Bulgaria is not too far from them, by the way. Um, so one of the reasons why, 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 people, why scholars are very interested in the topic of happiness is because of what, what psychologists call the happiness advantage. What we find is that happier people tend to be far more successful in life. You know, they tend to be healthier, they, have to, they tend to have more friends, they tend to be more creative and productive, they tend to have more successful marriages, they tend to cope better with stress, Yes, to some extent, there is this reverse causality, right? I mean, if you're a happier person, if you smile more often, if you have a pleasant personality, people are probably more likely to like you, and you're probably more likely to marry and to have a successful marriage. But there's been a lot of research that has been done in psychology that uses very clever methods to show that the causality actually goes the other way around as well, that happier people actually are healthier people. As a matter of fact, the Gallup organization, which now tracks happiness, in about 100 countries on a daily basis around the world, found out in this study in 2014, in which they found out that every year United organizations in the United States lose about $500 billion in, in calls because their employees were not happy. So what's happening right now is that organizations recognize that happiness is important. And we have this research that, that, that has shown that happier people in the workplace tend to be more productive, they tend to be more engaged, they tend to be less likely to leave their job, they tend to be more creative, they tend to be more accurate, they, and they tend to be more successful in sales. So businesses are very interested in happiness. They're very interested in how to promote happiness in the workplace. And a lot of businesses are transforming their traditional model where they just provide people with monetary incentives. As a matter of fact, now there is this, this is the weirdest position in corporate America. You know, you've heard about CEO, you've heard about CFO, this is the CHO, the Chief Happiness Officer. So Google and many other good organizations now, chief, now have Chief Happiness Officers. So if you ask this guy, who is the Chief Happiness Officer in Google, he says, my job is to enlighten minds, open hearts, create world peace. So he goes there and asks his employees if somebody is kind of uh, uh, being not happy or uh, in their, their down, they, they, he goes to them, tries to meditate with them, tries to lighten their mood. 
And, and this is becoming more and more common. A lot of organizations are recognizing this. If you work for Google, I mean, it's a fun place to work, right? You can have a person on the soils, you can have a gym there on site. I mean, there's child care. There's a lot of things that, that Google is trying to provide to make people employees happier. Oh, sorry, that, that's me playing with the PowerPoint. Uh, this guy, this guy, his name is Dan Price in Gravity Payments. And uh, he was a sensation a couple of years ago. And he read this study that was published by two, Harvard, uh, by two Princeton economists. And what the study found out is that beyond $70,000, $75,000 a year, money doesn't make you happy. So he pledged, he read this study, he was very impressed in what he said. You know what? I'm going to pay every single body in my company at least $70,000 a year. And he took $2, two million dollar pay cut. And he said he wants to do this because he wants his employees to be happy. So this was all over the news. Uh, and, and when asked, like, how did your employees, you know, uh, what did they think about this? How did they respond to that? He said that everybody was super happy. People were saying, now I can uh, uh, finally move out of my mom's basement. You know, and now I can finally have kids. So uh, we, we don't know how this social experiment is going to work. It's very recent. But again, this is something that we, we do. It, uh, this is something in, that we find in happiness research. And um, it's making, um, it's changing the nature of organizations. I want to skip through this because I'm not going to have time. We can go back to it. It has to do with how we measure happiness. And I want to, uh, I want to come to this slide. My goal today is to talk about 35 to 40 minutes and then give you a chance to ask questions. Uh, Jeremy asked me to talk about, in general, about the economics of happiness, so I don't have a lot of time to get into the nitty-bitty details, but you guys are welcome to ask questions at the end. Um, I want you to, to look at this, uh, I want you to look at this picture and to tell me, uh, look at these squares, look at square A and look at square B. And I want you to tell me which one appears lighter to you. It shouldn't be that difficult, is it? Which one is lighter, A or B? And I'm not trying to trick you, I'm just being, when, when you look at this, which one looks lighter, that's all? B looks lighter, right? A lot lighter, as a matter of fact, than A. That's how we perceive it, that's how we see it. Now, what I can do here is I can actually bring a background and I can show you that both of these squares are actually the same color. And in, insofar as you trust me that I'm not deceiving you, you can take the PowerPoints from Jeremy afterwards and check this for yourself. They really are the same color. So this is a cheap visual illusion. And the reason why I'm showing you this visual illusion, and again, like if I go back to the first slide, even though I just showed you that they're the same color, you still have a tendency to perceive B to be lighter than A, right? So what I want you to think about here is to think of this as a metaphor of how we perceive things, as a metaphor of how we make decisions. I mean, human brains actually have a very big specialized area that is dedicated to vision. And, and human beings are, are very visual creatures. We, do, we, do, we look at things all day long, and we're very good at, at doing this. And yet your brain is deceiving you in a very predictable way, right? I can use logic. I can use reason. I can bring this background and I can show that both of them are the same color. But as soon as I go back, it's almost like you haven't learned anything, right? Your brain keeps deceiving you that those two squares have different colors, different shades. Now, this is important because in economics we often talk about, uh, in economics we often make this assumption that people are rational, right? They make, they're very good at making decisions. And a lot of people say, but look, you know, economists are wrong because people make mistakes all the time. This is not a problem for economists. As a matter of fact, what is entrepreneurship? Entrepreneurship is making choices in the face of uncertainty. And when you make choices in the face of uncertainty, a lot of times you fail, right? So failure and making mistakes is a very big part of how we learn. So that's not a big deal for economists. Making mistakes is not a problem for economists. The problem is when you make the same mistakes, over and over and over again, and you do it in a very predictable way. Just like this graph here. I can show you that they're the same, I can go back, and you still have a tendency to perceive them. And this is a visual illusion, right? This is something visual that we're very good at. What about things that humans haven't had a chance to kind of learn how to do better, like financial decision making, or dating somebody on Facebook that's relatively recent, right? So you can think that your brain could be deceiving you in the same way, in a very predictable, in a very predictable way, 
uh, uh, disabling you to make these mistakes. So let's apply this to happiness now. When you think about behavior, a lot of our behavior is driven by what we think is going to make us happy in the future. How many of you would like to be happier in the future? Raise your hand. Most of us want to be happy, right? Why are you in college? Well, because you want to earn a good degree, you want to find what you want to do with your life. And it's not that you're selfish, you're self-interested, of course. You want the best future for yourself. And part of it is because you want to be happy in the future. So let me test. Uh, this front area of your brain is called the prefrontal cortex. And a lot of psychologists tell us that when you make decisions, uh, and you kind of think about the future, you know, one of the great things about human beings is that we can simulate experiences. You can imagine yourself in the future, and you can experience things even if you actually haven't experienced them. So yesterday when I was in my room, I was kind of going through my presentation in my head and was thinking how you're going to be super happy, you would clap at the end, I experienced that joy. Um, <laughs> so your prefrontal cortex is the one where a lot of the decision making takes place. Okay? So let me test your prefrontal cortex. Let me give you two different scenarios that every one of us could probably relate to. On the one hand, we have these guys here that won the lottery. They won millions of dollars for the lottery. And on the other hand, we have this boy here who was in a terrible car accident and he became paraplegic, so he won't be able to walk for the rest of your life, uh, for his life. What would happen in a year? Which one of those people would be happier in about a year? What do you think? Who would be happier in a year? The millionaires or the paraplegic boy? What do you think? Sorry? The boy. But do you truly believe that? I mean, if you really truly believe that the boy is going to be happier, why don't you go and try to get into a car crash? I mean, is it, I mean you, I'm sure that in your, in your heart you truly believe that it's the other way around. Because I play the lottery sometimes, and I certainly put my belt because I don't want to be far of and I think we all of us, yeah. I mean, I'm asking you to kind of use your intuition and kind of try to think about which one would you rather be? Everybody wants to be a millionaire, right? And nobody wants to be a paraplegic. But what we find out in this research is actually very strange. About a year later, what we find out is both lottery winners and paraplegics report very similar levels of happiness. At first, of course, when you win the lottery, you're very ecstatic, and you're excited about it, and you have all this money, and when you, when you can't walk for the rest of your life, people punch into deep depression. But only about a, a little bit over a year later, both of these groups of people, on average, I mean, of course, there are exceptions. Some people stay happier, and some paraplegics commit suicide. Uh, but on average, what you find out is that these two groups have almost identical levels of happiness. As a matter of fact, sometimes, I mean, here is John Whitaker. He won $360 million from the lottery. And uh, over the course of several years, he lost most of the money. His uh, granddaughter um, uh, died out of overdose. So here's he got estranged from his wife. And here's an interview in Fox. And he said, I wish I'd never won the lottery. So I mean, there, there are also. And what we find out is that a lot of times when, when people win the lottery, uh, all of a sudden, their friends become kind of estranged from them, they ask them for money, people become isolated, they think that buying you know, fancy things is going to make them happy, they're going to have this glamorous life, it turns out that buying all these uh, luxurious items doesn't really bring as much happiness as you think. So a lot of people actually don't experience this spike in happiness as we believe. On the other hand, when people experience major life trauma, what happens is that all of a sudden they have a new perspective of life. A lot of people come, support them, in order for them to be able to cope with every day to day, um, from, with their lives from day to day, they have to learn to look at life in a different way. They, they learn to enjoy the simpler things in life. And quite often, this group even becomes happier. And yet, our intuition kind of tells us that it's the other way around. So, this is a very pervasive cognitive bias. Economists and psychologists, behavioral economists, call this cognitive biases. And this particular bias is called impact bias. And what well, impact bias is that we fail to estimate how much happiness both positive and negative events will bring us in our life. I mean, you break up with your girlfriend and you think it's the end of the world, your boyfriend and you think it's the end of the world, you know? And then a year later, you're just fine. I mean, my students, after they fail an exam, come to my office and start crying. They say it's the end of the world. 
can they retake the exam, can they earn bonus points. Two weeks after the semester is over, they don't even remember who I am. So, <laughs> so, I'm, so, so, so in, the, the impact bias is very pervasive, and it happens in our, our, our lives all the time. But it has huge implications for how we live our lives. Because if you believe that making more money and becoming happier is going to make you happy, but then it doesn't, and yet a lot of your decisions could be based on it. So economists, behavior economists now are recognizing that there are two different systems in your, in your brain. One of them is very fast, is very impulsive, is very automatic, it's very emotional, and by the way, very creatively they call these two systems system one and system two. And system two is very slow, deliberate, very conscious, very effortful. So system two, of course, is better guide for our behavior. Okay, when you sit down, when you write things down, when you try to really calculate how to live your life. But it turns out that most of the time we base our decisions on our intuition, on our current emotional states. And it turns out the system one tends to rule our behavior. So we're not as rational as we think we are. So the final thing I want to talk about, and we can go back to this, there's a lot of interesting things to be said there, is talk about this question that is very big part of our culture. Can money buy happiness? Okay, so let's see. Here's Benjamin Franklin. It says, money never made a man happy yet, nor will it. The more a man has, the more he wants. Instead of filling a vacuum, it makes one. Here is Bob Marley. Money is numbers, and numbers never end. If it takes money to be happy, your search for happiness will never end. Money is better than poverty, if only for financial reasons. It doesn't matter if you're black or white, the only color that really matters is green. So that's my favorite. Oh no, wait. For I don't care too much for money, for money can buy me love. This is my favorite. The trick is to stop thinking of it as your money, the IRS. And here is Oscar Wilde. He says, anyone who lives within their means suffers from a lack of imagination. So obviously, clearly, if you start looking at how people feel about money, you're going to find all kinds of different, uh, different opinions about it. But I want to show you some data. So I'm a scientist. I study happiness. And I want to, I want to look at the data. And I want to see what the data tells us. So here is data within a country. This is from the United States. So one piece of evidence when it comes to money and happiness comes from, from looking at the United States, picking one country at a point in time, and, and looking how rich people compare to poor people. And if you look at this graph, it's pretty clear that the richer you are, this particular graph measures life satisfaction. And uh, it's clear that the richer you get, the happier you get. I mean, if you make more than $150,000 a year, virtually everybody says that they're very satisfied with their life, which is one way in which we measure happiness. But if you make less than $10,000 a year, I mean, majority of people actually say that they're somewhat dissatisfied and very dissatisfied with their lives. And the more money you make, all of a sudden, the, the happier you report to be. So this is one piece of evidence. Now, what's interesting here to, uh, to know are a couple of things. The first one is that notice that even very poor people sometimes would say that they're very satisfied with their life. Even the poorest people in society would say that. And you know, uh, this sort of observation has been criticized in the development of economics literature. Sometimes when you go to the poorest countries in the world, and you, let, let's say you go to Calcutta in India, where you have a lot of poor people, people that live with less than a dollar a day, you will find a lot of people that would say that they're extremely happy. And uh, development of economists, a Nobel Prize laureate, and Marshall Sen says that this is a psychological mechanism that people use. If you're very poor, if you have a very difficult life, one way for you to keep enduring through this difficult life is to deceive yourself that actually your life is good. So, so sometimes this is this will be also one criticism why why not why we shouldn't use happiness data for this type of research. Uh, I already showed you the graph that looked across countries, and there the correlation between money and happiness was virtually identical. It was very very strong. But where things get interested is when you look what happens over time. And we can relate this to the idea of hedonic allocation, this notion of the impact bias that they just showed you. Here is data from the United States. And what you see here, it goes back to the 1970s, uh, to 2012. And uh, on the one hand, I have graph here GDP per capita. And you can see that the trend is upward. We're actually two and a half times richer today than the, we were back in the 1970s. 
But what happened to happiness over this period of time? Well, it has stayed kind of flat. It's not that there is any trend there, right? It's not going up, it's not going down. So this has been this was an observation made by Richard Easterlin back in the 1970s, okay? And it's called the Easterlin paradox. Now, why is this a paradox, by the way? What do you think? It's a paradox because on the one hand, money matters. If you look at what happens within a country at a point in time, and if you look at, if you look at the data across countries, I mean, the evidence is overwhelming. People are happier if they're richer. But then on the other hand, as we get richer, oops, if we get richer, it seems that money doesn't matter. Okay. So, and the, by the way, the United States is probably one of the few countries where you observe this. There is not a lot of data over time. And this is one of the most intensely debated kind of topics right now in the happiness economics literature. Uh, the problem is that we simply don't have good data to go back to the 1970s and what happens over time. There are different studies that show different things. But this is a very pervasive sort of paradox. So what explains this paradox? On the one hand, why we don't get happier over time has to do with this notion of hedonic adaptation. I mean, you can think about this in your life. I mean, I can testify to it. When you're a student, your goal is to get good grades, right? And you get your good grades, you get your degree, you think you're going to be very happy, and then once you, you finish, you're extremely happy for a couple of months, maybe a month, and now you have to find an internship, now you have to find a job, right? And then you find your first job, and you're like, oh, if I only have a good job and I make $70,000 a year, I'll be very satisfied. And then you get the job, and then you're like, well, I mean, I have to beat my sales quotas because now I want a little bit more. And so you always adjust your expectations and you always kind of want a little bit more. As a matter of fact, what we find out is that when you ask people, what do you want? What, how much money do you need in order to, to be really happy? Everybody says, as much as I'm making now. Everybody wants to double their salary. The person that makes $10,000 says, if I only make $20,000, I'll be very, very happy. And the person that makes $100,000 says, if I only made $200,000, I'd be very, very happy. And the other part of it, so why is it that money matters then in a country at a point in time? Well, one explanation has to do with the idea of social comparisons. And this is a theory that goes back to sociologist Leon Festinger. And what he said is that almost everything in life has value relative to something else. I mean, think about your, your own lives. I mean, Let's say you're taking Jeremy's class and you got a C. Is this a good score or is this a good grade or a bad grade? I mean, I hear he's a very easy professor. It's an easy A. So, I mean, everybody, if everybody else got an A in the class and you got a C, that's not very good, right? But what if you take organic chemistry and you're the only student who got a C and everybody else got an F? All of a sudden, this C doesn't look that bad, right? So. The idea there is that we constantly, relentlessly compare ourselves to other people. How tall you are, how clever you are, how, uh, how good-looking you are, how rich you are. All of these things have, have value only in comparison to something else. My wife has this little Etsy shop that she runs, and on days where she doesn't make sales, she goes and spies on, on her competitors, and if they haven't made the sale, she, she brushes it off. She says, it's okay, it was a slow day. On the other day, she sells a lot of items, she goes checks the competitor, and if the competitor has sold more stuff, all of a sudden, why is it that I haven't sell? He even feels frustrated by it. So a lot of the things in our life have value relative to something else. So why is it that rich people in society are happier than poorer people? The idea is that, well, I mean, if you're richer, you're richer relative to other people. And we tend to compare to people that are similar to us. So students compare to students, and professors compare to other professors. Um, so one of the interesting questions there is if there is a saturation point. If, if there is, uh, as you earn more money, are you getting, uh, it, does money kind of stop bringing happiness to you? And here is Arnold, he says, money doesn't make you happy. I now have $50 million, but I was just as happy when I had $48 million. Um, so the critical point here is how you, how you look at happiness. I mean, and I'm going to show this graph and talk a little bit mathematics here. It really matters how you, how you measure uh, this relationship, whether you measure it as, a, as levels or, or as a logarithmic form. So what we find out, if you look at this graph in economics, we have this idea of the diminishing marginal utility, right? Remember this idea? 
So the first donut that you eat brings you, it's good, it makes you happy. The second donut is good too. But as you keep eating and eating donuts, maybe you get to the point where you start throwing up and donuts don't make you very happy. So the same thing with money. Can we, do we find the same relationship with money? As you make more money, at one point it just stops bringing you any happiness. And if you look at the data across countries, I mean, uh, what you find out is that kind of the relationship levels off a little bit. So at first there is a rapid increase in happiness, and then it kind of bring you, start, start bringing you less happiness. But the critical thinking, uh, the critical thing here is uh, comes from psychology. There is this law of psychometrics. And what this law says is that what matters to people is relative changes. And if you look at this graph, if we use a logarithmic form, what I'm looking here is at relative changes. So, and what we find is that the relationship is extremely strong. This is the graph that they showed you. Now, what does this mean? It means that a 10% change of your income if you're poor is going to bring you the same amount of happiness as 10% change if you're rich. And we don't seem to find a lot of saturation when it comes to life satisfaction. So the relationship is very strong. This is the graph that they showed you in the beginning. Of course, if you're poor and you make $10,000, uh, 10% change in your salary is only $1,000. But if you're very rich and you make $1 million, 10% change in your salary has to be $100,000. So this is the reason why you find this relationship here. But if you use the logarithmic form, you don't find it. It's actually extremely strong. It also matters which type of happiness. People often cite the study by, uh, by the two Princeton economists in which they found that money doesn't matter. Up to, up to $75,000, money makes a huge difference in your life. But beyond $75,000, it doesn't seem to matter. This is only partially true. What Kahneman uh, and Deaton did, uh, Kruger, I think, is the study done by them, they looked at about 500,000 people in the United States, and they found out that when it comes to your evaluated happiness, economists often talk about two different types of happiness. One of them is more reflective and evaluative. You think of your life and you evaluate your life. And the other one has to do with your current emotional states, how you feel right now. You experience this real time. You could feel anxious, you could feel sad, you could feel cheerful, you could feel the top of the world. So this is the affective type of happiness. When it came to evaluating happiness, money mattered. There was no saturation point. It was this ground that they just showed you. The, the richer you are, the happier you are. But, it, but when it came to your effective well-being, it only mattered up to $75,000 a year. And it kind of makes sense. If you're very poor, and if you live, I don't know, under a bridge in a box, maybe you know, having $10,000 more income could really make a difference in your life. You could have a car, you could drive to work, uh, and you don't have to deal with daily frustrations. But that is only up to $75,000 a year. So I want to finish my presentation with something puzzling. Uh, one of the promises of, of the economics of happiness, and then I'll give you a chance to ask questions. One of the promises of economics of happiness is that it, it helps us kind of understand a little bit better some of, some of the patterns in society, and it brings some insights uh, relative to what economic theory would predict. Generally, what we find out is that women are happier than men. And back in the 1970s, this, this gender gap in happiness was extremely high. Women were just overwhelmingly happier than men. But over the past 70 years, this gender gap has almost disappeared in happiness. So today, women are probably are still slightly happier than men, but a lot less happier than they used to be back in the 1970s. This is very puzzling for economists, because in the past 30, 40 years, um, lives for women have improved significantly, objectively speaking. They make more money today, they're less discriminated in the workplace, they have more control over their life uh, because of contraception and so on. So, and there is a lot less uh, sexual harassment. Even though there is still some discrimination, even though there is still some harassment, there is a lot less today than there was back in the 1970s. So objectively speaking, women today are living a lot better lives, but they're not happier. So I want to finish with this paradox, uh, and I want to give you a chance to ask questions. There's a, lo a lot more interesting things we can say, but I just wanted to give you a brief overview, and then give you a chance to ask whatever you're interested in. But thank you.